while I was in my very first two years at Stanford, I created the David Forrest Booking Agency. I was booking the bands for my own uh, dorms, parties, I was a social trip. And there just seemed to be an affinity between me and rock and roll bands of that caliber uh, at that age. I liked them, I liked the idea of getting them jobs and making a few bucks getting them the jobs. So I guess I was born and bred to be an agent or manager. And uh, when I booked the band that had Stevie and Lindsay called Fritz Rabine Memorial Band, I knew there was something extremely special about them. I then stopped going to Stanford uh, two years after I started. So this was now, by 1968, I was not going to school anymore. I had a full-time little company. David Forrest Booking Agency. And this was in San Jose, California. And I was I was the one booking most all the high school dances. I I had the contacts with all the, the best of the bands. And then started even, you know, having contact with some of the San Francisco bands through Bill Graham's uh, organization. So I could like produce like little shows with Quicksilver Messenger Service and Santana and the Young Bloods and Country Joe and the Fish. Um, and in doing that, I saw that I really liked the, the business. I liked the rock business, I liked promoting, I liked the management, and I went to work for Bill Graham in uh, March of 69 and stopped booking all the little bands. I continued to manage the band with Stevie and Lindsay but now I suddenly was handling the bands that Bill Graham was handling. He managed them. Uh, the Airplane, Santana, uh, It's a Beautiful Day. Uh, there was a whole group of San Francisco bands that we represented. I booked Grateful Dead and Santana to the Woodstock Festival, and that was basically my swan song. And then through the six months that I was with Bill um, and booking, I, I did deal with a few of the bigger promoters out of LA that bought some of the talent. and. Uh, met a few agents from LA, and I ended up getting a job in September of 69 at IFA, International Famous Agency. And suddenly, I was not even 21, and I was booking Janis Joplin, The Iron Butterfly, uh, Chicago Transit Authority, uh, some very major acts. I worked there at IFA, and I lasted about six months, and I turned 21. And I got a call from the famous agent and manager, David Geffen. And he worked for a competing agency, CMA. He had just signed the Iron Butterfly and their manager raved about me. He said, you gotta get this kid, Forrest, out of IFA and get him over here to your CMA. And while I was there, I continued to manage Fritz, um, kind of on the side. When I left uh, CMA, to open my own agency. I figured this is now, so now it's time for me to be on my own. That's when I decided uh, I would debut them or showcase them to some record companies. There was a, a producer, I forget the fellow's name, and he had a studio out in the valley and he's the one that actually played some material of Stevie Lindsay's for Mick Fleetwood. And that's how that all came down. Mick Fleetwood loved the sound he was determined to put a, a new band together, um, and he got with them, and you know, they came to me and said, you know, Mick Fleetwood's contacted us, um, and Buckingham Knicks had become an act. That was what they were called. They had, had a couple of records. And I said, well, if you're gonna be with Fleetwood Mac, that's certainly gonna be a great opportunity for you, and you see what happened from there, and I was not included in that, right. that deal, unfortunately. But as, a, as an independent agent, I mean, other than Leon Russell, who was my big act at the time, was back then, he was very, very big. I didn't have really enough acts to make the whole thing uh, fabulous. So I decided, well, there's only one more thing to try, and that's promoting. And of course, there is the hit and miss. I mean, if you put your money up and buy the talent and rent the auditorium and sell the tickets and advertise and don't sell enough tickets to make enough profit, you don't last. Right. Well, I seem to have a flair for picking the right acts. It was fun, obviously, it was called Fun Productions. 
and it allowed me to spot talent when they were on their way up because I read all the trade magazines and all the tip sheets and saw who was you know, bu bubbling and who had a single that got some airplay. And when I started seeing things for Kiss, and Aerosmith, and ZZ Top, and at that point those acts were not big acts. So I was getting acts that really, by standards of seniority, I shouldn't have been getting, but I'd got them. And um, you get those acts and you make, I made money with it. Oh, I swear, on, on Kiss and ZZ Top, you know, other the other couple of promoters in town, I was like, hey, you're crazy, you're gonna do Anaheim Stadium? I can remember just the discussion of doing Kiss at the Forum. The other couple of promoters in town, they didn't want to touch it. They thought, they figured, you might sell seven, 8,000 seats, but how are you gonna sell 18,000? It's real simple. For Kiss at the Forum, I packaged in a great another act. I put Aerosmith with them and we just promoted the hell out of it. Uh, by 1977, summer of 77, I had reached the, plat the, the, the top of what was gonna be going in the music business, I think, and um, everything seemed to go downhill from there. And that's when I got involved in the local scene, which kind of makes sense. I mean, here I am promoting all these uh, big stadiums and big arenas in the West United States and all, and when that all ended, what, what did I have left to promote? Well, local bands. And I got a job at the Whiskey and Go-Go. For the first six months, I was just trying to clean up the reputation because basically the owner, uh, Elmer Valentine and his partners, of course, Lou Adler and all, um, they were concentrating on the Roxy at that time. And they didn't really care about the whiskey as long as they could break even and maybe have it open on the weekends. But there were some bands that meant were meant for the whiskey, mainly the new wave type stuff. Now I was talking to them about the whiskey a go go, not even the Roxy, right. the whiskey a go go, which some of these people had not been there for years, and they heard that it was stinky and it was punk rock and and you know it was you know sound system wasn't great and all that, so it was kind of hard to get the acts, but for whatever reason, uh, certain of those acts came to see me about managing them. It wasn't so much just playing there, they wanted me to be involved, and Choir Riot was one of those acts. And sure enough, when there was a chance for Kevin to make a deal and to record, and all the years that they'd been trying to get a deal mounted up, uh, the thing was a gigantic success. Elmer and I would did, did a couple of concerts, and then one time I did a concert with Gang of Four, and then the next two days put him with the whiskey. The concert wouldn't have been so bad, but some kids broke a bunch of windows. I got blamed for being in collusion or something with the agent for some of those bands. And they got fired, and the minute I got fired, I picked up the phone, and I had always been friendly with Gary Fontenot, who ran the Starwood for Ed Nash. And I went down there, and he was very disappointed with David Knight, who was doing all the booking, so he, Fire David Knight hired me. I brought with me, uh, when I went to work with the Starwood, this lady, Michelle Meyer. She comes back and says, uh, David, <laughs> I don't know who these people are, but I think you'll think they're cute. And they have a picture. I says, Michelle, what is it? She says, they're called London, and here's a picture. I look at this picture of the two boys. So I said, have them come back here. So they come back. And I said, typical, I said, so what's your deal? <laughs> well, we're London. They worked themselves up to being star with headliners, whatever that means, for you know, Friday, Saturday night. Saturday. And then, of course, uh, it went for a while, and then Nicky decided he wanted to put his own band together, a different band. And suddenly you had Motley Crue, who I gave their first booking they ever did. 